So I am Seth Grimes. I'm Maryland organizer with the Washington Area Bicyclist Association. You all know what WABA is. This is the panel on mapping bikeability and walkability barriers. I will simply introduce the speakers by name and then turn it over to them. And then I will help with the Q&A after they're done the presentations. So we have speakers, Charlie Grimes with Greater William Prince, sorry, Greater Prince William Trails Coalition, Michelle Burton, who's project manager with Institute for Public Health Innovation, John Lincoln, data analyst with Prince William Health Department, Ernie Porter, mayor of town of Okaquan, and Diane Anderson, Community Health Care Coalition. Would one of our speakers like to pick this up? And then you can hand off to from one to another and uh, take it away. So let me pick it up. Uh, we're the folks south of the Okaquan River. We're the newest members of the Capital Trails Coalition. We're happy to be part of the team. We were organized as the Greater Prince William Trails Coalition a couple of years ago to amplify the voice of the bike pedestrian community. And one of the key factors that we're trying to address is where is it possible to go safely on a bike with a baby carriage or on your feet? Uh, we want to discover the places that are, are safety issues and try to fix some of those. Uh, Michelle is going to walk us through our our dashboard where we've identified some of the spots of specific concern based on some of the past. So Michelle, let me let it hand over to you. Thank you. And I just wanted to clarify that although I do work for the Institute for Public Health Innovation, my role here is actually the program manager of the Community Healthcare Coalition Greater Prince William. So I have a presentation, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Are you all able to see my slides? Yes. I'm not actually able to view you. All right, great. So, so how did we get involved? We're public health folks, and how did we get involved with trails and transportation? So I'll start off by saying that you may be aware that, you know, Oprah said it, many other folks have said it, that our life expectancy is influenced a great deal by where one person lives. So you know, we're here because we recognize that, you know, place matters. And so this has led more health professionals, such as Diane and myself, to review the complex and interdependent variables that comprise our health ecosystem, which of course includes transportation and transportation access. And some of you may also have heard the term social determinants of health. Some have also called it the social detriments of health. Pretty much those are the factors that can influence your health that are not related to the biomedical model of disease management. All right, so um, again, why are we involved? So you are already probably well aware of the numerous benefits of an active transportation plan and investing in pedestrian and bicycling infrastructure. But I'll just reiterate the points that, you know, we as part of the Healthcare Coalition, we want to encourage people to walk and bike to and from places because, well, one, it's the lowest barrier way for people to get their recommended amount of, you know, daily physical activity. It's also a very low cost way for people to get their recommended exercise to help prevent chronic disease. And there's mounting evidence that that environment makes it easier for people, uh, which makes it easier for people to walk <laughs> and navigate safely has an influence on people's activity levels. And so again, looking at the social determinants of health of how we do the design of our environment can influence you know, our health outcomes. And then there are so many <clears throat> additional benefits to being physically active, not just in preventing chronic disease and morbidity and mortality, but you know, there's just a lot of benefits of just being a physically active person. Uh, again, there's a lot of evidence you probably already heard today showing that there, there is empirical evidence showing that when you change the environment, you know, there is an influence on how much people can bike and, and walk a day. And there is an, a reduction in people's mortality and uh, morbidity. And it even has the greatest influence on people who do not exercise regularly. So there's a lot of uh, documentation that shows the relationship between the built environment and physical activity uh, with an association between transporta transportation-related physical activity and infrastructure. 
that supports biking, walking, and transit uh, related um, um, modalities. And um, also, there is a link between the design and accessibility with physical activity levels and designing active friendly or activity friendly places. And um, so I also have on this slide just a number of the, the numerous health benefits of, of living a, a healthy active lifestyle that we wanna promote as part of our coalition. And there are benefits not only for your individual health, but benefits for all. And so looking at the whole community, the direct and indirect linkages between transportation systems and the broader community health is, you know, a sense of well-being, cohesion, improvements in, you know, what people report in their quality of life. There's a case study analysis of subjective well-being as related to transportation among residents in Denver, Colorado, between having a number of transportation options uh, related to quality of life that actually was not. Um, and also having a car or not having a car didn't have the same impact, you know, as having the, the multiple options. And so we also should explore the relationship between, you know, the attachment to a place or what we call um, a sense of place or, or place making, a one's social capital as well as one's health. Community cohesion is understood to be a key component of crime prevention through environmental design, which utilizes design management and the built environment to reduce crime, fear of crime and to promote public health, sustainability and quality of life. So there's a lot of evidence, you know, talking about that and, you know, even looking beyond health by creating these the multiple ways for people to travel, we think would also help the economic health of the community, uh, boost relationships, as well as neighborhood revitalization, as well as the reducing the overall healthcare costs for us as a society, so. All right, so in addition to reducing chronic disease, morbid morbidity, mortality, we also see it as a way to like boost and, and enhance our community. So another piece, the reason why we're involved is looking at, we wanna reduce the pedestrian fatalities and injuries where we've seen an, an, an alarming, increase over the past few years. So I've included a statistic from the uh, National, let me get that, National H Highway Traffic Safety, and this is nationwide data sharing about 2021. We also saw an uptick in our region, which is Prince William County, City of Manassas, City of Manassas Park. So we are alarmed by this and many of the residents are alarmed uh, by this increase of injuries and fatalities in our community. And I also wanna note that it's not only just the fatality that we want to recognize, but that there is a lasting impact on families for years. And also for those that even if it's an injury, they may experience a great deal of mental trauma, you know, and stress associated with, with traveling, you know, for years to come, this may have an impact on their use of opioids, and this also affects their family and their family's well-being. And this also can affect, you know, their economic stability. If they lost the way that they travel to and from work, well, that has an impact for not only that family and that person, but for that community. And we did see that in some of the incidences in our region that some people were struck by cars because they were walking to work and um, there just wasn't another available method uh, for them to get there safely. So uh, so there's a lot to that besides, you know, just the the number of of how many people had had passed. So we just want to recognize that. So those were some of the reasons, you know, surrounding our inclusion in in these discussions and in being part of these meetings. And we're very grateful to working with the Greater Prince William Trails Coalition. And so just to give you a general overview of what we've done together is that starting in 2020, we have, were part of the CHIP, which is called the Community Health Improvement Plan. Many uh, health districts have to create one as well as any hospitals that are nonprofits, they create a Community Health Improvement Plan. So one of the priority areas identified by residents and by community leaders was the neighborhood and built environment was one of the designated priority areas. So then given the pandemic happened between 2020, 
2022. A lot of the efforts had to focus on that. So in 2022, I came on to um, manage the coalition and to dive deeper into what exactly in the neighborhood and built environment we wanted to investigate. We did a community survey. And in that community survey, people indicated their concern for young people, uh, their lack of transportation options for them to get to recreational facilities or programs, their concern for pedestrian safety and bicycling safety, and the lack of uh, programs that young people could participate in. So as well as uh, the increase of community violence. So that gave us a good direction to go on in the coalition. And that's how we partnered with the Trails Coalition and many others to understand better what role we could have in improving the infrastructure for pedestrians and cyclists. And so last year we were part of the Trail Summit that Many of you all may have participated in with the Wash with WABA as well as Northern Virginia uh, Regional Commission as, as well as many others. And we've also partnered in creating a trails database, which would include all of the trails, both in existence, planned, and aspirational trails across our region. And the purpose is to show how we could, you know, better use trails as another way to get from point A to B that would be safe you know, that would address, you know, our needs for getting people to be active as well as their needs for safety. And it would also create a map to showcase for future uh, policy uh, makers to understand where we need to put the funding so that we need those really important trail con connections because in order to get people to use, uh, to, to walk or to use a bike, you know, the place to go to must be desirable. So there's two components. People need to feel safe in traveling on their own. So they need to feel safe from other cars. They also need to feel safe from violence. And they also need to go to a place that they want to go to. So we can't just have a trail going, you know, nowhere. So, so that's why, you know, all of this just seemed to tie in, tie into um, one another very nicely and how we came to be a partner with Charlie and the, and the Trails Coalition and others. So what do we intend to do? Well, we have a dashboard, so we want to- Michelle, uh, let me suggest that we move on to our next speaker. We have uh, just 17 minutes left for the panel. If I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, sure. No, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> so we do have the dashboard, and so we can talk about that next. And we do want to do some community engagement with our um with residents to find out what they would like to do together. So I'll stop there and, and hand it over to Charlie and, and Ernie. So Michelle will post a link in the chat to the dashboard so you can see where we are identifying in a more uh, locally specific way, uh, crashes, bike pedestrian issues associated with our community. Our coalition is looking to build a, 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 a mobilize a crowd of people with shared interest uh, where our Venn diagrams overlap. And one of the places is with our school system. Uh, and we're also, it turns out, able to focus on climate change and the opportunities for us to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So Ernie, who's the mayor of Occoquan and an all-around smart guy, is going to tell us about that. Okay, th thanks, Charlie. Thank you for the kind uh, words. The uh, uh, as Charlie said, I am the mayor of Aquan, but I'm really speaking today as the chair of uh, the county and school systems joint environmental task force. Now, other jurisdictions have uh, bodies like this, I know, but it's it's very new for us in Prince William County. We just started in February uh, and we meet monthly. I like to describe it as a group of technocrats. I'm not one of the technocrats, but the major uh, the the major membership is uh, staff members from the school system, which is the largest employer in Prince William County and then staff members from the county. And the idea behind the Joint Environmental Task Force, which is something established that was established by the school board and by the Board of County Supervisors, is to get uh, these technocrats from each body talking about things that they can collaborate on uh, that would help meet the county's environmental sustainability master plan goals. And as you probably know, and uh, as Charlie is very familiar with, one of these things to meet the 2030 targets of cutting greenhouse gas emissions is a sort of mode shift with regard to transportation involving things like walking uh, and biking. 
So what we're trying to do with JET and uh, what, what's particularly interesting about this particular project uh, that I'm in, we're involved in right now is that it is not a project that emerged from county staff or from school staff. So something that you would think this body would typically be dealing with where uh, either the school system staff or the county staff raise something they want the other to consider or collaborate uh, on or that they might have best uh, want to discuss best practices about. The challenge for a group like JET is what happens when something comes to you from the community. So it doesn't have an owner necessarily in the county or the school system, but it's much more grassroots. And this is our first real test of that is what we have in front of us now is a suggestion from the community that one way to look at um, the opportunity for reducing greenhouse gas emissions is to make walking or biking to what I will characterize as community centers safer. And we're using as the metric, basically the school system's one mile radius where they, they suggest that folks walk. You can't get bus service uh, from that uh, distance, but we've expanded it to include, to identify it as community centers, not just schools, but also um, uh, libraries and parks. And the idea that's so grassroots about this is a group of volunteers came forward and said, look, we will provide the labor to ground test these things. So if someone can give us GIS support to identify the routes in that one mile radius of those community centers, we will ground test them. And so that's what, what JET has done is gone to the school system to ask for GIS support for this for uh, areas around schools and the county to ask for the GIS support for the volunteers for community centers like libraries and parks. And so the, the hoped for uh, product of this is a series of maps that we then, uh, then have as a concrete description of where we have gaps. And then we can start pursuing the political and other means that are necessary to find funding to fill those gaps. So that's what we're doing. It's a particularly exciting project. I think it's also a real test of JET, this new body, because it is the first thing that we are addressing that is coming from the public. And I'll, I'll leave it there. So the coalition is coalition, uh, overlapping the climate community's concerns, the safety community's concerns, the health community's concerns. And as Ernie said, we're really a bottom up process here. So we have lots of studies. We have transportation land use connection studies for 12 schools to get safer routes to schools. We have a safe routes to schools program in the county. We have multiple exercises to identify issues after an accident occurs or a crash, right? Because we know they're not really accidents. Uh, what we're struggling with is we're not mobilizing effort to solve the problem. So by inviting all the different folks who actually have a shared concern, we're hoping to make good trouble and create a critical mass of people that are, are interested in uh, an action plan for bike pedestrian safety, interested in an action plan for expanding our bike pedestrian network, and interested in funding the action plan so it doesn't sit on the shelf and just gather dust. Our strategy is to involve as many people as we can from the bottom up. So we said we could do an analysis with aerial imagery and look at 96 schools and a one mile circle around the schools. And we could then say, oh, here are the lines on the map that need to be improved. Instead, we're recruiting volunteers to go in and do site specific assessments of these places, libraries and parks, other community centers will be included as well. Uh, and our goal is to produce a bunch of pretty pictures and to produce a bunch of pretty maps and to have a bunch of people engaged in the process. So at some point, there's enough public pressure for action to occur. We've had a couple of incidents we had uh, in a neighborhood that is actually filled with gated communities and rather high wealth. We had a couple of incidents. So now there's a plan to build a $15 million bridge in that one neighborhood. But that's not necessarily the most equitable way for us to approach improving uh, safety in our community. There's a lot of other opportunities for us to, to look at the crash dashboard that the Community Health Care Coalition has crafted, working with the Virginia Department of Health. And so we will be able to highlight, here are the equity emphasis areas, here are the bike pedestrian incidents that we've been able to document, 
what are we going to do about it? And if we have enough people engaged in the process to say, here's the problem, here's some solutions, here's the way for us to do something about it, then we hope for action to occur. And then the magic, magic, magic word, funding to occur, to implement our, our strategy, to create a safe, integrated bike pedestrian network in Prince William County, Manassas, Manassas Park, and the four towns here in Prince William County. We have a comprehensive plan mobility chapter just recently adopted by the Prince William County Board of County Supervisors. It doubles the length of our trails network, uh, adds another 400 miles. There's the National Capital Trails Network, which it does extend south of the Occoquan River and does include our area. Our Transportation Planning Board has said we need to finish building that by 2030 to facilitate the mode shift. So we need to find funding to build out the National Capital Trails Network. We have the uh, Potomac Heritage National Scenic Trail, a regional trail that runs through Prince William County. Our December 4, 1774, Dumfries, a town in Prince William County, adopted the Dumfries Resolves and started moving us towards American independence. And then 1781, uh, the French and American Army marched through here on the way to Yorktown. So we have identified that we really ought to get this stuff done by 2031 for the semi-quincentennial, a new word for us all to learn, the semi-quincentennial of uh, the American Revolution. And if we are going to start, let's start with safety. Let's start with those intersections that need flashing pedestrian beacons and need a safe way to cross. Let's start with the schools where we know the kids should be able to get some healthy exercise walking and biking to school. If we get enough volunteers, and this is all very much in the early stage of this process, if we get enough volunteers to tell people at their school, this is important to us, then we think the school principals will get more engaged in supporting a Safe Routes to Schools program, which is a sort of marginal program in Prince William County. And I don't even think the city of Manassas has a Safe Routes to Schools program. So our opportunity is rich for us to uh, expand the bike pedestrian network, uh, but also to expand the, the safety element of our bike pedestrian network. We'll be getting some uh, geographic information system support. Uh, it may fall out of the sky. I'm not quite sure how it's going to actually show up, uh, but our final product is not just a group of engaged volunteers, but a group of maps with pictures and reports 96 schools, a handful of parks and libraries, there ought to be enough information, enough graphic and visual information for the elected officials to go, oops, I ought to fix this. I should do something about it. So that's our game plan. That's our strategy. It is one of many uh, initiatives uh, to create bike pedestrian maps, especially at the regional level. It's one of many initiatives to address bike and pedestrian safety. Uh, we know we have to spend a lot of effort to coordinate what we're doing so that instead of stepping on toes, we're helping people. Uh, we're part of the solution instead of creating a problem. But our expectation is that we can, by all the faces you see on the screen and all the groups that we've organized in the coalition, we can bring together that critical mass necessary to, to get action and to get funding. So that's our story. We do have time for some questions, if there are any questions out there. And we hope that you'll look at the dashboard that Michelle has put a, a link in the chat so you can see the, uh, the narrowly focused incidents in our community. Uh, you can look at multiple dashboards, VDOT in particular has some really good te uh, technology, but finding those, uh, or specific sites is useful. Michelle, why don't you go ahead and just show the dashboard if you could. Can you bring it up? Oh, yes. <clears throat> I also have some photos to that kind of helps elaborate your point, Charlie, about specific intersections that we ground truth to show that were nearby schools, as Ernie was talking about. So I can also share that as well, uh, just to give people mm -hmm. some context of what we're talking about. So 
Um, while we're waiting for questions, I'm going to go ahead and share the dashboard. I hope you're mm -hmm. able to see it. Okay. I can't see you, so just let me know. <laughs> Let's dive in. So the darker blue areas represent locations of the higher density of incidents. And um, <clears throat> so that's crash density. And then the, on the right, you could see the different colors indicate different types of injuries. So the purple is fatalities and the red is severe injuries. So what we have is pretty much a heat map. And so we can go, <clears throat> this takes a minute to load. And so what we're able to do is go and find out those specific intersections where we see a number of the crashes. And another thing that we're doing is we're gonna meet with, we've already been meeting with several transportation folks, but we're gonna meet with the police to receive more context behind some of these incidences. You know, one of our challenges is a lot of our reports associated with uh, bike pedestrian incidents blame the biker or the pedestrian highlight that they're not wearing bright clothing that they're walking in the street uh, michelle if you've got the picture of the uh, dumfries location uh, we can show you where there really isn't an alternative this is a particular bridge built in the 1960s over i-95 where we put a sidewalk on the bridge but we never built a trail to connect to the sidewalk so you have to dodge the cars entering and exiting onto the I-66 ramp or onto the I-95 ramp. Uh, it's a very busy area. And sadly, last year, mm -hmm. uh, a pedestrian was killed. Uh, the blue is where the sidewalk is. The red is where there's no connection to the sidewalk. All these years, we've never built that connection. And in the police report, it noted that the individual was walking in the street. Well, where else could the individual walk? There is no path for no safe route for that individual to walk because they can get across the bridge safely, but they can't get past the entrance and exit ramp safely. So there are behavioral approaches to addressing our uh, bike pedestrian safety issues, but there are also infrastructure uh, built environment opportunities for us to make our community safer. Uh, and so this is a particular specific example where uh, we just keep beating the drum that this is broken, needs to be fixed. And at some point we expect it to get fixed. We just don't know quite when. Charlie and Michelle, you have a question in the chat from Patricia Browley. What is the source of the data? Is it solely from police reports? So the data comes from Virginia Department of Transportation. The TREADS reports, I believe. Yes. So what we've done is screen out a lot of the information that is not relevant to our particular concern so that we can highlight that one item. Uh, we want to focus on the safety in Prince William, Manassas, Manassas Park, and in the four towns. So a lot of the other information that's in TREADS uh, got screened out by this particular dashboard. And I'll just add as well, the data analyst who developed this dashboard, uh, who works at Prince William Health District, his colleague of mine, um, he has indicated that this data source is publicly available. So to those that are able to attend this webinar, I just wanted to share that the Department of Transportation has a very, very thorough and comprehensive dashboard that you can also look at on their website and into exactly what Charlie stated. Then it was our data analyst that using the program Tableau was able to then filter out specifically what was of interest to us for our research questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, so if you want to engage with us, you can also give us feedback of who else you'd like us to share this dashboard with, as well as additional data layers once you take a look at it. All right. Uh, thank you.